because of my trauma, I woke up from the greatest slumber and I didn't, that I didn't even know that I was in. And so having the humbling privilege of getting to work with people as they come back to more of who they are is I cannot, I cannot express the joy that that gives me in words. Like to see people, to see those lights go on in their head when they remember their body, when they feel pleasure again, when they're able to lead from their heart, when men are able to not be afraid of their emotions but recognize the power yeah. within them, when a couple is able to, for the first time, um, not be afraid of love because they've finally mended those wounds within themselves and are able to meet another in that way. Like, I do believe in my own personal experience and with every survivor and with every person I've ever met, our greatest trauma is always the key to our greatest treasures. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyun. We are on site in Los Angeles, in California. We are gonna be talking about all things sexual assault, all things healing, all things coaching, all things spirituality. Very excited, blessed, honored to have Coco McKenzie joining us on the show. Hello. Hi, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, I'm really excited for this. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Coco has a really incredible background and we'll be diving deep to all of these topics throughout this conversation. She's an inspirational speaker. She's a sexual assault survivor. She's a transformation master. And she's helped people live most their most radiant lives after sexual abuse. Over hundreds of women over the last three years. So yeah, this is a very, this is a very serious show. Um, but at the same time, we have to be play, you know, play as well and dance. But it's so it's it's a lot, and it's hard even for me to 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 do like this. is just it's a harder it's a harder topic, and and you know that's what I'm feeling right now. Mm. And why yeah, do, sexuality. Why? I think for most people, sexuality. Um, feels very heavy, especially when you tie in any layer of abuse. Um, and one of the most yeah. simplest truths is that laughter is the best medicine and that sexuality is meant to be blissful and playful and shared and it is not always, and the healing path to it is not always heavy and it is not always serious. So I appreciate your vulnerability in saying that and that's also part of the problem, is that we need to shift that um, reality. Because when it is treated as so heavy and so dense, it kind of, a lot of people stay away or shy away from it. Yeah. And that's the very opposite of what we need because we're yeah. all sexual beings. And when one of us heals, we all heal. So. Just yeah. that right there is, is very interesting to me because like you said sexuality is supposed to be this consensual uh, incredible experience and whenever the word abuse comes in just the whole body's just like no like that's so not okay and then the way to get away from that density when abuse does happen is through that lighter that's that is quite an interesting way to to think about it, and you, you so you, 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 you're specialized in this, and I'm excited to to talk about the, to talk about this. Um, okay, I want to I want to start. We always kind of start with a big history perspective on civilization, and this will be interesting to hear what, how how you are viewing things. Um, yeah, for me too. <laughs> <laughs> you're like big history. I'm like, wait, uh, what? what? <laughs> Alan. Okay, lead me, <laughs> Alan. Where do you want to? So we find ourselves as stewards of Earth yeah. after a period, long period of evolution, and yeah. there's 7.7 .7 billion of us now, and yeah. there's a lot of complexity in the relationships between humans, and 
I'm, I'm curious, what is your synthesis on this current state of humanity with all of the exponential technology and all of the complexity between our relationships and communications? Hmm. Oh, I... I feel a little bit of embarrassment to say I don't spend most of my time considering like society at large. I think my natural, um, where my thoughts naturally go is so much more um, micro. And so in all of the interactions I have daily at a grocery store, um, yeah. in a, in a yoga class, I, and it with, so with every micro interaction I have, I can see the, the macro, um, but I get it through an individual experience. So what is the current state? Um, we are, I feel that we are isolated. I feel that we're alone. I feel, um, that technology is a wonderful tool but it is out of balance in a lot of people's lives. Um, so that, I don't, I don't know yeah. if I'm That's really good. answering your question. Yeah, you but. are totally answering it, yes. And I found it really interesting that you do, you've really become, you've become so specialized at the micro, at the nuance of the one-on-one human emotional expression that maybe um, that's something that we can we can see that certain people are focusing more on that certain people are focusing more on some sort of a more abstract uh, de- demographical analysis of all of the people on the planet so that's cool how people can ebb between those or specialize in those but then yeah I think it on. all blends perfectly together like the world as we know it is operating is true like it, it is what it is you have some people more focused yeah. on global yeah. scale you have people yeah. more focused on um, you know you have global scale all the way down to the immediate one-on-one and it works um, speaking of things that are out of balance like you pointed out mm-hmm. with technology as a tool is a little out of balance you we also speak f- frequently about how feminine energy there's a, definitely an out of balance going on but an kind of an up rising of a feminine energy that's coming Mm -hmm. and that's we're starting to feel that it's feeling more like earth energy it's feeling more compassionate more heart-centric that's what it feels more like to me and I want to hear about that because that has a lot to do with your practice I want to know about that that balance that's a little maybe off right now Mm -hmm. and how you feel it sort of rising up um the balance i feel is off between masculine and feminine yeah um well it's a it's a give and a take um, and it kind of goes back to what I was saying about the separation Um, because we're all have within us the masculine and feminine energies it's giving and receiving it's um, um, produce or rest it is um, the head and the heart like we all have that and so I think as as society evolves um, we are getting, we are becoming more emotionally intelligent, um, and there is. Women are creating more of a. Women are stepping into more of our fullness, um, and I know that that also requires for men to step into theirs because you can't have one without the other, because that masculine and feminine, it's not. I don't view it as two separate things. I view mm-hmm. it as a scale. Mm-hmm. So, and that applies to like good and evil, black and white. I view, I view everything as a scale. And so I feel like as a society, we are coming a little bit more back into center. Um, mm-hmm. But I have to ask me a little more about yeah, that. I'm, yeah, that's, that's, that's right. That's how I feel about it as well on a, on a scale and coming more towards an, e- an equilibrium. Now, 
this this is this is so in my in my you know in very deep inexperience with what with sex and relationships and love and and abuse this is a it's like it's it's a quite a it's a quite a beautiful yet complicated thing as we were pointing out mm-hmm. earlier and it can be dense it can be light it's kind of so so tell us about what it's been like you know working in this in this field leading up to um we'll go leading up to what was um leading up to like 2012 but like what's it been like working in the in the field it's <laughs> it's been the greatest gift of my life um i because of my trauma i woke up from the greatest slumber and i didn't that i didn't even know that i was in and so having the humbling privilege of getting to work with people as they come back to more of who they are is i cannot i cannot express the joy that that gives me in words like to see people to see those lights go on in their head when they remember their body when they feel pleasure again when they're able to lead from their heart when men are able to not be afraid of their emotions but recognize the power yeah. within them when a couple is able to for the first time um not be afraid of love because they've finally mended those wounds within themselves and are able to meet another in that way like i do believe in my own personal experience and with every survivor and with every person i've ever met our greatest trauma is always the key to our greatest treasures mm-hmm. and we are not without choice and we are we absolutely have everything we need to heal and to live in wholeness and it is not an easy journey and again it's because of that the social conditioning around sexuality men and women vulnerability um the processes that we have set up as a society and then the heaviness that like as a result all of that feels heavy to most people and so we steer away from our bodies our emotions our sexuality and it keeps us numb and then we have a society that is disconnected and in pain and unable to relate and have everything that they want um because what we want is usually you know locked behind some very scary guarded door <laughs> scarily guarded door I don't even know if scarily is a word but I'm making it up <laughs> I need it to be yeah. a word right now so yeah <laughs> the, that that was well behind our traumas are some of our greatest treasures I have always found that to be true if it is not without a like great dedication to get to that point but i have seen that if a person commits to themselves their gift is like you get to it through the path of pain suffering yeah. trauma like but because again i believe everything is one so so your greatest fear and your greatest desire it's the same thing where are you on that scale mm Mhm. So if you're experiencing deep depression and fear of being intimate and um if you're to the level of pain that you're experiencing that pendulum like it has to swing equal and opposite the other way if you're willing to do the work. Mm-hmm. Um and I I know for me I didn't see anyone in my life do it. Like I didn't I didn't have I wasn't raised in a community where I could look at the elders and go I want my life to look like yours. You're got like you're doing something right. I didn't have that. And so growing up, I didn't there wasn't a I wasn't given the tools to do that. And then through my trauma, I was raped in 2012. I remember googling 
what do you do when you're raped? And rain um, was the only thing that really popped up. And when you're inside of so much trauma, you're literally reduced to infancy. So I couldn't read, like I just saw a white screen with a ton of black words and I was like, I, like, I don't know what to do with that. And what I needed was somebody to break it down and to give me the tools. And what I've been blessed with now is, is wonderful people that have taught me. And that's now what I, my whole life is dedicated to, is helping people really, really, really live a life that they love. And it doesn't matter what you've experienced. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> but it's there's, all good. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's 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 a lot there. There's 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 you talking about this. Well, what 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 is like a a, a moment of 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 full like you said radiance that comes on back online on on people when they get to work through their trauma and swing back over to that side of, of wholeness of, of for themselves and that is beautiful and that's so important to, to have that, that you're catalyzing that for others and that you're making actually programs to do so at larger scales which we'll which we'll talk about and then through your own story maybe you know to tell, take us through your own swinging of your pendulum <laughs> Oh God. Um, man, I the only, the best way I've been able to describe how I was immediately after the assault was like the walking dead. I didn't feel I didn't feel alive. I couldn't. Like, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't sleep because I had nightmares of being raped in every possible way that you could. I put this brick wall up around my heart and around just around all of life because I would feel like I'd be going through daily life and I would feel the emotions start to come up and I, I physically remember being like, I like push it down like the, it felt like water like the dam was gonna break and I didn't have the tools to process that um, I yeah it was it absolutely took the life out of me and because of all of that it's also given me everything that I have now but that's been one hell of a journey um, so let's see um, uh, I mean immediately after the assault uh, I went through I got to file or I chose to file with the police um, I had a wonderful officer, thank God, because you are thrown into an interrogation room and that is the scariest thing because all my subconscious knows of an interrogation room is when I'm watching a movie and someone's in trouble. So I'm thrown into an interrogation room going through the you know official report and it, like I, I just, I could feel nothing. Like the words were coming out of my mouth but I did not feel alive, it was completely numb. Um, is that standard procedure to, for reporting to be in an interrogation room? Yeah, if you do it at the police station, yes. You can um, report sexual assault through um, a doctor, um, through a therapist, through a gynecologist, through... Um, I didn't know that at the time. Yeah, yeah, so, this is the educational piece to, to things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because getting to report through your doctor, um, you know, another, I just helped a woman 
report and she um, went through her therapist. I was there, her therapist was there, and we called an officer in. So we were in a more safe environment. Oh, like wow. your system is yeah. more calm. Yeah. But I didn't know that. Yeah. You know, it was my first time. <laughs> So uh. <laughs> now looking back, I'm like, shit, I really wish I had someone to walk me through it. Um, so I was thrown into an interrogation room. I did the, I gave the full recount of what had happened to me, um, which is hard. Like trauma, it splits inside of, so it splits the, you know, your body from your mind, from your emotions, and then it also splits your mind into two. So the story of what happened and um, like the effects and how you feel, it splits in your brain. So it's why oftentimes we sound like we're not telling the truth because your brain's literally split. And so in trying to recount the story, it's so hard because you're like, you can't remember all the details. And I felt really bad for um, not remembering everything. I was putting a lot of pressure on myself to be able to give like a detailed bullet pointed recount of the experience and I couldn't because my body as a loving act did this you know protective mechanism of numbing me so I went through that I moved the police officer took me to um, the hospital which is where you meet with a trained nurse to go through the rape kit which is the forensic exam and that was the hardest part about being raped because I already felt I hated my body. Like I felt him all over me. It didn't feel like my own body anymore. I felt dead inside. I couldn't scrub my skin enough. And so to go into, you know, to be driven in the back of a cop car after being in an interrogation room to going through a forensic exam and then dyeing my skin blue, I felt like a science experiment. And I just checked out because I, I couldn't handle it. I had no clue what I was getting into. And I'm very grateful for that process now. But in the moment, it was hard. Um, the government's also changed the rape kit process to make it easier, um, but they had done that after I'd already had mine. Um, Driven in the back of a cop car afterward to the hospital. Yeah. And having your skin dyed blue to, to tell. Oh man, it was, because you're having to tell the story again because the police report and the, and the nurse, they haven't had time to um, sync up. You're doing it again for the nurse? You have to re you, I had to tell them again, which just felt like, it felt like a joke to me. Because I was in so much pain and I was so angry, having to, like I was getting angry with the nurse for making me tell her, even though you know, in hindsight she was doing her job and she was helping so, yeah. me, but I, I, I was too in my own trauma to understand that. Um, and it's hard. Like, it's a cold, sterile room. It feels, you feel like a science, I felt like a science experiment and they, like, they take photos of everything. They take skin swabs. They ask you, you know, where on your body will there be the most evidence? And, you know, for me, that was, my vulva, my anus, my, my back, like, and so to, to already be so violated and then to have to sit there and do it again is really difficult. Um, and I wish I had known better because there are things that you can do to make that process easier. And that process is the biggest investment I made in feeling powerful. Had I not reported and gone through that rape kit, I would not, would not be able to heal the way that I have healed. Like that gave me my voice. It gave me my power back. It helped me to, to stand proud. Mm. 
it helped me to reconnect to my body. Like as hard as it was, it's been 10 times better. I, and I, I don't want anyone to be, to avoid the more like immediate hardship for, for a long-term gain. Like this was back in 2012. The system's gotten a little bit easier since then. And now we have women who are creating systems to help because assault in America happens every one minute and eight seconds. And no one's talking about it. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. 95 go unreported. And I, I know 95% go unreported. I believe that our silence. Is that because you like follow up with them like, like later in their life and ask them and they said they didn't report it? Is that how we know that statistic? It's on rain. This program has evolved over time, but at the time when this was happening, um, you, yeah, you had a limited amount of, of tools available for you or Google searching. And now people like you are making the tools to make this significantly more, um, um, like you said, you had empo- like you you gained power back by reporting it, and that was yeah, and that's a huge part of this um, point. And so is having this kit, this easily available kit, uh, and and like e guide, electronic guide to to help with this process more easily. Yeah, I think trauma happens when the system's shocked. So we need to reduce shock. What I am creating is that it is a a very simple breakdown of one of the most difficult processes you could ever go through. So again, you can't, like for me and for all of the other assault survivors that I've spoken with, worked with, and trauma specialists, like we know that the brain can't take in that much information after any level of abuse, whether it's sexual or not. So the reason why I couldn't process Rain's system was it was just too much for me. Um, so I've created Fresh, which is an, a free e-guide, for, and it's the immediate starting point post-sexual abuse. So there are, you know, I teach you how to the best practices for filing, for reporting an official, um, for officially reporting, for um, there's a rape kit guide, what to bring, what to avoid, what evidence is, how you store it, where you submit it, um, how to tell someone and who to tell. Um, Practices to keep you calm through the entire process. Um, That, and it's just, you know, the, the checklists are like one to two pages. And so had I had that, it would have drastically limited or reduced my, um, the, the trauma. Um, and that's, that's my hope and what it does for others. Yeah, you, you, started, you started this list and this list is, you said, you know, checklist guide preserving evidence, how to file a good report, who to tell, how to tell them, yeah. how to remain calm, these best healing practices in a very, like you said, for one of the most traumatic experiences, a, a simple breakdown of how to handle that. That's what to provide to people, yeah. Yeah, and it's with such deep humility that I create everything that I do because I... I'm not a doctor, I, um, and I really understand that it's such a personal journey. Um, but as a survivor myself and as someone who bled, walked, and crawled her way back 
to life. Like I speak and I create from an honest, vulnerable, sincere place and I don't claim that it will that it's perfect, but I I but it's it's gotta be helpful. And that's my heart for it. So it's I don't know. What's the uh, are you are you comfortable talking about the violation of consent that happened with the with the yeah, guy? What, yeah. yeah. For me? Yeah. Um for me <laughs> there wasn't any. <laughs> he didn't have consent. Uh so it was a complete and total violation. Um, yeah, I... And th was this, how does someone do that to someone else? What was going on? Were they intoxicated? How does someone do that? I have thought a lot about that. <laughs> um... And the only explanation that lands in my heart that feels true enough for me to believe and like put my life on is that hurt people hurt people. I don't anything beyond that. I I I don't know. <clears throat> so healing hurtness can save a lot of other people from being hurt. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I I believe the ripple effects of one person like is being hurt can like, just go and butterfly effect out if that if that if that's not healed quickly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean you can leave a wake hurt, of hurt and healing have the same ripple effect. I believe. Oh. Like if you're if you're hurt you're having maybe a more of like a slightly negative ripple effect. Mm -hmm. And then if you're healed, you can give like a positive ripple effect. Yeah, but it's, it's one drop. For every healing act, it's a drop. Of, For every hurting yeah. act, it's a drop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of positivity or negativity? Yeah. yeah, okay, okay. Jeez. <laughs> what the fuck? We, How are you feeling? We, <laughs> trying, to, <laughs> trying to stay light and trying to stay light. You, you can tell that you after, you know, seven years feel more, you know, that you're doing the, the work. And, you know, yeah. me, I'm, I'm sitting here trying to make sure that, um, that other, um, I don't know. Part part of me, part of me, r is reminded about how I try and help men sometimes realize that you know that women give birth and try and like get behind the eyes of women that you know are carrying a child within them for nine months, and trying to help. You know, you're trying to. You know, you're helping me right now get behind the eyes of what it's like to to you know. Be vi have your consent violated in an abusive, assaultive way, and then go into like an interrogation room with cops, and then a hospital. Like that's just yeah, and science experimented. That's this is, you know, that I think stories like that can 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 drive more empathy for men to to care more about about listening, to care more about helping make sure that other men don't you know, violate consent that they're hold themselves to account accountable for that. Um, there's like a kind of a controversial, like controversial, like uh, Gillette ad that was, did you ever, did you ever mm. see that? Yeah. Gillette just played like an ad that had uh, um, like trying to get rid of like toxic, toxic masculinity and try and, you know, boost up like good masculinity. And then it became kind of like a hit piece for some conservatives to say that like, screw Gillette, you know, mm -hmm. and like, for me, I thought there was a lot more nuance to it. Like I thought that it was actually like kind of, 
important in some ways for men to like see that and say like yeah like I like like I want to be I want to be held I want to hold you know I want to hold consent as something that I really care about I want to help other guys you know hold consent as something that they care about there there was there's more nuance to it but I think the consent um, when I boil down when I ask what is beneath consent, what consent stems from, to me, it's respect. Personal respect. Because if you don't have personal respect, you can never respect another. So, if a human does not like themselves, take care of themselves, is not happy with themselves, that is gonna be exactly what they put out. And so consent, while it's incredibly important, I think as a society, we actually need to go deeper because we wouldn't be dealing with consent if you and I respected, if I respected myself and you respected yourself meaning at large yeah like yeah because then when someone says ah no thanks it's not personal yeah it's and not you personal. respect that it's not person's personal. yeah desire yeah uh declaration opinion like exactly. it's about being secure in yourself and if we had yeah, humans yeah. that were secure in themselves i really believe we would experience far less bullying, abuse, assault, all of it. Yeah. yeah, that's 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 a that's a great perspective on it. Agreed. Yeah. Gosh. <laughs> yeah, it's just it seems it seems like such a yeah, such a simple thing to respect <clears throat> someone else's sovereignty in the way that they say that they are not interested in just Is it though? Do most people yeah, you're right. do most people live their like follow their own desires trust themselves do most people do most people trust themselves no not really do most people actually live their lives in a way that they that is fulfilling to them we we all think we wouldn't we wouldn't perform the same catastrophic actions as a as an Auschwitz guard but due to the environmental circumstances that we may be under that it's hard to say if we would or not and so for example if you take the trauma of someone like potentially the person that um, that violated your consent that it's hard to say that you would be a better person because there is something so traumatic buried inside that hurt hurts hurt yeah yeah and I don't he didn't just violate my consent consent he violated my mind my womb, my body, my blood, my dreams, my ability to have a period. He violated my trust in myself, my trust in every single human I encountered for years. Trauma affects every single area of, of our lives and so does the healing. And it goes back to hurt people hurt people and I also have to imagine that somebody who can do that like you brought up the Auschwitz guard somebody who's capable of this level of treatment they learned it from somewhere I have to assume like their environment yeah some stimuli from uh, 
pre potentially transgenerational, potentially from TV or music or wherever else. Yeah. Wherever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's, it's crazy how you talked about the, also the violation of the mind and the dreams. Um, there's a lot, yeah, it draw, it's deeper. It's like a multi, <clears throat> it's a multi, uh, faceted and multi-year, um, in, integration of trauma for healing. And so you're, you've, you know, and this is also, there's different trauma comes in different uh, ways. There's a significant consensual violation um, and, and a rape. There's um, like an abuse. There's just like a, a, a physical abuse, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, maybe of like a, of a hitting or something like that, of a, that, that kind of a trauma. Um, so, yeah, but, the, but yeah. the mind and the body don't actually register it that way. Humans do that. Humans put the titles on it. In, from a scientific, medical perspective, trauma is trauma. doesn't matter if it came sexually. It doesn't, I don't want to say it doesn't matter because that makes me sound super insensitive. But according to the chemicals produced in your brain, it's not different. So, I mean, continue, but I just the, thought that so, that's important. So, so um, what's... Do we know like a neurological or like physiological change that trauma makes on the physical matter of the brain? Mm, the physical matter? I'm not sure. I know that trauma um, disrupts sleeping patterns. It changes um, organ function. It impacts um, communication. It impacts... I mean, we are holistic creatures. Yeah. So everything, everything has cause and effect. And trauma is not excused from that natural law. So it, it bleeds into every area of your life. Yeah, um, yeah. I see what you're saying on sleep and communication and all mm -hmm. these things that are affected. Um, okay, and, the, and then... Um, It's, it's it's crazy to think that a like a, that a, like in a physical abuse and like a sexual abuse can have a can have a almost same traumatic effect on the mind even though they're like different in a huge way that's yeah you know, PTSD is PTSD interesting like so, so then is the fresh, so fresh what, you, what, you, what you're making and, and have made and available on, on the website, which is the links in the bio, that that walks through all different, any, any, any kind of PTSD, any kind of trauma integration? Uh, no, fresh is uh, an e-guide for your starting point post-sexual abuse. Post-only so, sexual, so not, yeah. not physical, it's only, only sexual? Um, it's only for sexual abuse. Only sexual, okay, okay, gotcha. Yeah, because okay. it's how to file a sexual assault report, it's gotcha. rape kid, it's... Who to tell and stuff. Yeah, yeah. so but it's... Some of that blends over though into physical, like who to tell, how to file a police against uh -huh. just physical as well. So there's some bleed over, I guess. Yeah. 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 Some overlap. Um, wow. Um, okay. Now, so now, so now how do you like, tell us about your, like, you know, you started us off with, uh, t t t uh, reporting it gave you power and then, yeah. and then where did the power, uh, how did the power how did you integrate the trauma and overcome the adversity to even start going and and being very powerful with your story and leveraging that like your pendulum swing? Tell us about your pendulum swing and then how you went and even started helping others. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> uh, well, What fueled me in the beginning was 
Um, it's a bad word. <laughs> Say it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, was just a very big fuck you. Was all I felt. And I felt so much shame and guilt and, and like, it was, it was crippling. And I remember thinking pretty immediate after the event, what if, what if this happened to someone else? What if he did this again? Mm. And then like, I just felt like, I felt like my chest was caving in and I felt like if I didn't do something, I would be helping him mm. do it to someone else. And that, like even now, like my body just wants to like crawl. Like I just, oh, yeah. oof. So what, that was my driving force for a very long time, um, was a lot of anger and the determination to make sure he never did it again. And most assailants are repeat offenders because we're not reporting them, because we're not getting in trouble, because we're not making them change. And so the thought of me not doing everything that I could, like that would, that would have ruined my life. So for um, the next two years, I was basically silent because I was so afraid of burdening anyone and I really did not want anyone's pity. So other than my detective, because I had filed a criminal lawsuit, um, my detective and a couple other people like involved in the case, I basically did not tell anyone. I had a partner at the time um, and he was wonderful. He was my backbone through the entire process and I am eternally grateful for him. Um, but I really, I didn't allow myself to begin to heal because I was holding everything in. I was holding the trauma in with my voice, with um, not being honest. I, and, and because I felt like all I had was my anger, that if I let go of that, what would I have? And that was very scary. Um, and that drove me for about two, two and a half years. And then I had stress induced hemorrhaging from my vulva that hospitalized me twice. And I remember, it, I was like in and out of consciousness. <laughs> I, I don't know if this actually happened in real life, but it happened in my reality, where I, th I thought, I felt like one of the nurses or doctors or someone, it was a man, like grabbing my shoulders and being like, you need to figure out how to share. You need, like you are, I think I was 22 at the time, 23 or something, you are so young, this should not defeat you, you need. And I remember leaving the hospital and going, well, I don't know what to do because I had been in talk therapy, but that for me was not helpful because I was already in my head. I was analyzing everything. I was keeping myself safe as hell. I didn't trust anyone. I was on talk. I was so vigilant with all of life. Like I had, I had like nine hamster wheels going in my head, managing every single situation, trying to keep myself safe. I didn't need to be in my head. I completely disconnected from my body. I had zero emotions because they all freaked me out and I didn't know how to process them. So I needed something else. Um, and while I know therapy is very helpful for a lot of people and I'm grateful for it, it's still true that it didn't help me. Um, so after, the, after being hospitalized, I, I had decided that I would do whatever it takes to heal because I was not going 
to let this man ruin my entire life. Yeah, like 70 more years of happy, potential happy, flourishing life, yeah. Yeah, and I didn't know how I was gonna do it, but it didn't matter. I was so determined to go to the ends of the earth to find it. To swing your pendulum to the opposite side quickly and, um, yeah, yeah. So just yeah, even just <laughs> even just saying that is like, how does you know how does one do that? You know how does one swing it quickly and you gotta you gotta uh, you gotta have a lot of crazy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I fully owned my You're crazy. crazy. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like it's the only reason. Like it's yes, the only way yes. this got done because I was crazy, crazy enough to be like, no, yeah, no, I'm tired of my nightmares. I'm tired of not being able to have sex. I'm tired of not like looking in the mirror and seeing my rapist. I am tired of not being able to trust anyone, I am going to figure this out if it kills me. Because it's the rapes and like all of the PTSD and the side effects is gonna kill me or I'm gonna die trying to figure out how to be happy. And thank God. <laughs> yeah, I can, I, I, it's actually just thinking about the amount of cortisol stress over and over again, tra just traumatically replaying and being fearful, that that would be so bad on one's health, so bad oh, yeah. on one's flourishing. So to swing back the pendulum and figure out how to help, it's like two things, it's figuring out how to A, prevent this in the first place, preventing assault and rape in the first place, and then two is when, when in these circumstances to figure out how to swing the pendulum back fast for all Trauma. This can somewhat be applied to like the trauma experience from maybe like a very close like friend or parent dying, um, hmm. something like a, a, another trauma of sorts that people experience and like to, to replay like a death over and over again versus to swing a pendulum back over yeah. quicker. This is, a, this is a good analogy, I think. Yeah. 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 So it's... So your specific pendulum swing, you roared and you were crazy. And <laughs> I was crazy. Yeah, yeah totally. I, uh, I was crazy. I left um, my former career and I literally went to the ends of the earth <laughs> um, where I was met by the most incredible souls. I studied sacred, sacred ancient body work. I, um, sat with grandmothers in their in in indigenous tribes going through ceremony i sat around fires and was blessed by native women i i gazed with infants i did yoga meditation um, trauma release breath work i did dance therapy i i lived in hawaii for three months and and got my hands in the dirt every day because it made me feel alive. Like there was nothing that I didn't do and that is when I realized that there's no separation between anything. And so if trauma hits every layer of our being, then the healing has to hit every layer of our being. And that's sexually, emotionally, physically healing, intellectually healing, cellularly healing, ancestrally healing to get back to bliss. So I studied, um, and my, my entire life was dedicated to healing for another maybe two years. Timeline's not really my thing, um, but another two years. And then I just naturally fell into sharing what I had been gifted. And now I see the importance and the impact of sharing and healing and getting back to a life that we love. Um, and that it's always worth it. So that's my like. <laughs> yeah, this, when you work now, you, you, you illustrate this, you know, if trauma hits all these different parts of our life, then healing has to hit all these different parts yeah. of our life. How do you go about, you know, you listed this incredible, like, you know, hands in the dirt, body work, 
uh, infants, grandmothers, like, you know, mm-hmm. like that's, yeah, you, you know, yeah. all, all over, healing all over. Now, does that same style apply to the people you do one-on-one coaching with through this healing process? How does that work? How do you like, how do you deal with the client's trauma and then help them through the process of healing? Um, I currently have two ways that I get the privilege of working with people. Um, one is an immersion, and then one is um, hourly, like regular hourly sessions. So with the immersion, it is a deep dive. Um, it's 48 hours, they go off the grid, and we meet everything that arises, um, and we do the work. Um, and people leave with total transformation, they leave in their power, they leave knowing how to address every issue that comes to them, they leave more connected to their bodies and their joy again and feeling able to feel safe again, they leave able to communicate and feel powerful and clear and just in their communication. It's the biggest gift of my life. Every time I get to work with someone, it changes me. Like I am so humbled by it. Um, and so in that it's, it's, we work with all seven bodies. So there are, you know, you're, there's the most modern talk therapy practices. We address, you know, the primal limbic and cortical aspects of the brain. We, we re-pattern very old limiting beliefs. We get you into your body. There's, there's breath work. There is, um, uh, body practices. I also do um, the sacred body work, which is like um, it's it's a, like a three-hour massage. Um, there's energy practices for people who are open to it. We there are spiritual releases. Like there's nothing that we don't do um, because they're worth it. Because their life is is it matters. Um, and then in the coaching, it's a lot of the same practices um but broken you know it's less of an immersion and a deep dive and it's more of a drawn out journey um so that's how that's how i'm able to help it's a a catalyzing the healing all over and then you do like a 48 hour immersion as the first process with them yeah Typically. Mm -hmm. And then it's kind of like a per case uh, basis of figuring out if they need to check in like for a couple hours at Mm -hmm. a later time, like in a couple days or something like that. Yeah, well, in in the immersion, because it is such a transformation and and they need, we need time to integrate, um, part of that package is a couple of follow-up, either in person if they're close enough or virtual sessions to really help them like ground and make it uh, a real part of their lives and to not just go from this deep awakening to I'm right back to my patterns. Like the, the reason why it works is because it's so practical and broken down so that when they leave, they have tools to meet every moment. And, but it's also a lifelong journey that we do need support on. Yeah. So. What would be some of the major takeaways for you from the hundreds of people that you've helped in the one-on-one coachings? Major takeaways. Oh, I'm getting like, um, I'm like seeing so many faces. And I just see everyone smiling with tears in their eyes. And it, I think it means, I know that it's meant something different for every one of them, but it is that true moment of like, like I can breathe again. And it's, it's that moment of them getting exactly what they need. Whoa. So. That's probably not answering your question. No, it is. That's a, that is it is. That's a huge takeaway. It's just it it really resonates. 
because I can't imagine 70 years of not of living a completely different life because I wasn't able to swing back a pendulum. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So to, when you do get it swung back and that, like you're saying, this, this, this arises of that, the tears and the huge smile that that, yeah. Good. We have fun. We have fun while we do it too. You do, yeah. I know, well, with you, <laughs> there's you body have work to have practices. Fun. Sometimes yeah. we garden. Sometimes there's art involved. Sometimes there's tantric practices. Like, it gets fun. <laughs> yeah, you have to be like playful like this, and it's so hard for me to to laugh during this. And but I'm glad that you're, you know, We're, you're, we, Alan, you are helping people heal. You are giving people the opportunity to come back to life, to feel again, to have better sex to be more confident you are helping people like that like as a survivor please hear that you are helping us and you're making a positive difference and that's a lot to feel light about okay okay i yeah. hope to do better at that and better understand how exactly i do that and help other people do that as well so it means a lot to to me and hopefully to just it just yeah thank you and it just again it just I just I can't it's hard to even process all of this really so yeah I think for me it's people humans we're not super motivated to do something when it feels heavy we're not sure we can do it. We're not sure how to do it. It like it, the the mountain just like stacks. But what is that perspective costing us? Because our thoughts are our first reality, and you are choosing not you specifically, but you are choosing heaviness. When what we, the perspective we could have on this is, you can do it. You can do it and we're gonna change yeah. rape and sexual violence around the world. And it is not, it's not the hardest thing you're gonna have to do. The assault was the hardest thing you will have to do. The healing, it's yeah. not the hardest thing. Living with the assault, that's the hardest thing. Healing from it, not but we don't hear that enough and so when as a survivor when I'm looking at my options it's like humans are motivated when they feel like they can and they know how and we're not otherwise Jesus. there's a lot of rhetoric that just occurs in the political sphere about about this and it's just kind of like you just want to ask so you just want to ask people to spend a couple hours talking to someone that has had sexual assault because mm -hmm. then I think they gain more empathy because otherwise people just speak about others without getting behind their eyes really well and I'm a huge yeah uh, I, I accidentally do this and then I aim to correct my behaviors because if I ever speak about s someone without sitting down with them for a long conversation, like this, the, this conversation changed the way that I think about this subject for the rest of my life. And mm -hmm. so if we have more people sit down for an hour and talk to someone that has went through this process, I think it will drive a lot more empathy and good behavior. Aww. Just you want to meet everyone. Hi, Luna. Come, come here. Come, come on here. the show. Come here. Come on the show. Big kahuna. Come here. Come here. So this is Luna. <laughs> this is my baby girl. This is my baby girl. And she loves you very, very, very much. Huh, Ooh. Luna? This three-month-old. <laughs> Beauty. <laughs> Little peanut here. You can sit right here. Um, to what you were saying about empathy. Um, empathy is powerful. 
There is also no teacher, like personal experience. And I say that because whether or not you, whether or not you have directly experienced the sexual abuse, I can almost guarantee you have experienced the effects of sexual abuse. So it does, like I believe that it, the ripple effect has, has reached everyone. We have, a, we have depression, anxiety, we, because of old PTSD, we have um, people who are not in touch with their sexuality or able to um, have orgasms because they're so disconnected from their body because of sexual abuse. So what if, what if your girlfriend has experienced sexual abuse when you're the, par you're the partner or her boyfriend? Well, that affects you too. That affects your, your intimate connection. That affect, like, it does affect everyone. So yes, let's have empathy and also let's look at how it affects y me because I, I do believe that, that our experiences are our greatest teachers and it's reached everyone. So that's my opinion. Yeah, I, I agree. There's a big cultural, there's big memes uh, moving around in culture right now about this. Um, mm. Huge memes, huge. And it's... Uh, memes are those pictures with the captions on it? <laughs> <laughs> What's is, it mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, just like uh, information that's disseminated through culture is uh, what a meme is. Oh is God, that's totally not what is, I Well, it's what memetics <laughs> is, so that's why uh, it is called a meme when you take an image and put a caption on it. But uh, it's still called a meme, but a memes are at, at, a, at a definitional level is just information disseminated through culture. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, now we're on the same so, page. Yeah. So these are like <laughs> ideas moving through culture. Is this? Yeah. yeah. That is. That is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Original. So, uh, yeah. Um, so. So. Holy cow. Um, holy cow! This is good. Yeah. Holy cow! You're you're doing it. We're doing it. Yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm like. <laughs> I guess I got I guess I got broken and pieced back together so many times in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, welcome, welcome, welcome to life, welcome, man. Welcome to life. Yeah. <laughs> normally, people don't break me and piece me, but I and get pieced back together. Nor, or, uh, like normally, that doesn't happen. I just I really yeah I think it was really important to you know to melt into into this with with full with full presence and energy and yeah. I just, yeah, just getting, you know, with all these practices of trying to get behind the eyes of, you know, of mothers that went through the process of carrying their child for nine months and then delivering them. And then trying to get behind the eyes of people that have actually survived a serious sexual assault. Like, that's another one of those things that's like, when you really go through those experiences, it, when you really go through trying to put yourself behind the eyes of those that are experiencing that, then... Yeah, can you just lightly toss around these things? Yeah, but you also you're good. You're good a one-on-one -on -one coach in that sense because you you can <laughs> go between the the ups and downs on the on the seriousness and then the playfulness. Serious, playful. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of my best therapeutic practices for curing myself of uh, sleep deprivation and night terrors was watching I Love Lucy. Like I watched it every night because I needed to go to bed light. I needed to go to bed laughing. If I woke up in the middle of the night, I needed something funny because laughter is the best medicine. I know it sounds so juvenile and, and like, I, I've never heard any doctor prescribe I Love Lucy, laughter, but like yeah. from, a real life experience. I love Lucy. Was my best medicine. <laughs> I wonder what th this is very interesting because comedy as medicine, 
mm. um, or potentially like other like uh, psychedelics, ps- psychedelic psychotherapy, potentially as medicine for as as treatment as therapy for for powerful. PTSD. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, it's so powerful. We have doctors that are now working with MDMA. Yeah. Um, I have worked with other. Shout out to Maps. We Shout out you. to Maps. We love you. Thanks, guys. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, yeah, man. My psychedelic therapeutic journeys. None compare. And then does psychedelics play an occasional role in the therapies for you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, It is an offering. Um, And because life is so personal and the healing journey is, is, there are no two healing journeys alike. there are no two humans alike, there are no two experiences alike. And so I, at the core of my practice, it is to, to serve you in the highest way. Um, so every, every journey is different. Um, but yeah, no, I do. That has been a huge part of my healing. I'm grateful to the doctors and the chemists and Mother Nature for giving us that life. Um, And yeah, it's very, very helpful. So there's the one-on-one coaching, then there's the fresh, this, this, um, the the electronic immediate response kit. Um, Then there's also the the courses, the retreats that you do Mm -hmm. as well. So that's all, you know, CocoMcKenzie.com, check it out. Um, I want to, let's walk through some of these sort of like end, end topics. Um, let's do this because you've, you know, you've been teaching me a lot about spirituality and this is very exciting stuff. Like you were teaching me a lot about the womb and teaching me a lot about creation. Yeah. Yeah. Being, <laughs> being the highest in Only the best thing yeah. ever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mentioned the womb so like several times about giving like, birth and carrying a child like that's a very very serious serious thing um like getting understanding it biologically about what's actually occurring inside of a woman um for those nine months as that child is literally developing inside of her um and then yeah coming biologically spiritually cellularly yes emotionally yeah, teach like, us. Yeah, all of it. Teach all us about it. this. This is very interesting. No, I don't. I don't. I don't know what to teach you. I just. I. Creation is the highest intelligence. Teach us is. about that. Like, teach us about that. It's preach, so, preach, preach, Alan. preach. <laughs> 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 My womb is getting so happy I hearing you like, like hearing a man be like the womb. The womb, the womb the is womb. like the ultimate creation. Everything is from the womb and goes back to the womb. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I mean, everything comes from, from, like, black, from the depths that's, that is our creative life force energy. Nothing, nothing would exist without the womb, without a, a, a holding, a container of the sacred. And... It's (laughs) It's <laughs> and it's also the source of all life, and life is very light, and it's beautiful, and it's joyous, and it's filled with bliss, and it is beautiful, and our ultimate gift. All of us can be grateful for life itself, and we can look to a woman for ushering us in. And, and I don't, I don't mess. I worship the womb 100%. What is this, this, this darkness when Mm. there's no light in the womb Mm -hmm. and then the, the life coming from the womb. This is just, this is all. Yeah. It's the, it is the, 
the great void that is also total and limitless expansion at the same time. Mm. You look at, you can compare it to the galaxies. Like, mm. a, all of life has that capacity and it is stored in our womb. And all of life begins as female. All of life begins as receptive, the receiver. And it isn't until hmm, a couple weeks, a couple weeks in, that that changes. But it's, I don't know how else to say it. It's the beginning and the end. It's the alpha and the omega. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it is the ultimate. And... And we all start there. And so it is interesting to see what great violation we have done to Mother Earth, to our own mothers, to our sisters, to, to the feminine within men. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, I feel more... Yeah, I feel like I've been moving more towards that on the spectrum throughout this talk, and it's been very important for me to do that. Moving more towards what? Towards feminine on this talk during this talk on the spectrum, and that's been it's been very good and powerful for me. It, yeah, it would, f yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the biggest gifts I was given um, through Darcy Bingham, who's one of my chosen mothers um, it was probably 2 a.m. <laughs> sitting around a fire and I had she like kind of she led me backwards and I came to the realization that my greatest power is my softness mm. my greatest strength is my vulnerability Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when, like, when that clicked, <sighs> yeah, yeah, I think I think that's very true. That may even be applicable for all people: is to unlock their own vulnerability, to unlock their own allowing emotion to to feel their deepest emotion. Guys, emotions are how we know we're alive. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Emotions are our life. Yeah, that's, that's actually... And point, yeah. before we are male or female, we are fucking humans. We're yeah, human. Yeah, yeah. We don't have a gender. We are alive. We are sensitive creatures. We are capable of incomprehensible things to great depths. Yeah. We're alive. We're human. We're a species. We are not a gender. And because of this weird power play and men visibly show and women don't, like this weird thing that humans have done over the ages, it's caused a lot of pain and suffering. But if we could just take that away and, and treat each other as life. As life, as humans, yeah, yeah, that's right. I, I do completely agree that unity and this collective mentality of of, of, of humans moving forward is so crucial. Um, teach us about God being within us versus outside of us. Um, gosh, I have such... <laughs> my humor. <laughs> I need to filter my humor. Um, I was raised in a fundamentalist Christian background. Um, and I am only speaking from my personal experience. I'm not, I am not making any of these statements like a blanket statement for re any religion at all. But for me, what I took from that, from learning that 
God was, you know, Jesus was this human without sin and, and God is this man, this distant man that I'm like just lucky enough that I was birthed into a family that had been given God. Like, oh my God, what, how lucky am I that I'm one who gets to, of all the seven billion people on the earth, I'm so lucky that my family knew about God. And that was so disempowering for me. Because it put my power outside of myself. And I am never without my power. I am alive. I am sovereign. I am here. And when I healed, when I got my head, heart, and body together and in communication, it turned a switch on where I realized we are all God. God is within us. I am God. You are God. And we, we are not, I am not, I don't have to ask a man in the sky to please hear me. I hear me. I will meet my needs. I will be with my inner child when she's crying. I will empower the woman within me to use her voice and speak up truth. I will show up in a loving way. I am the creator. And that's within everyone. And so going from the place of giving away my power, the, the biggest switch for me was going from giving away my power to fully tapping into the power within. And it's a, <laughs> a game changer for me. I, I, yeah. know, I know that religion has is, is been a beautiful thing for countless people. I'm, I'm <clears throat> only speaking from experience, but. I think it's really important to talk about God as something that is that is that is all all around us, within us. All that is love, consciousness. These different definitions of God that are not necessarily man in the sky type uh, definition, because that mm -hmm. is, I think, that is closer to the truth and of what God actually is. Yeah. And yeah, we'll. Uh, We'll see how the the uh, things evolve in the future um, of, of like religion and and um, and our definitions of God. <laughs> what what are these um, what are these what are these seven bodies of existence? You started talking about them in like dense density, physical, emotional, intellectual. Yeah, keep going. Cellular, ancestral, physical, emotional. Intellectual. Yeah, physical, intellectual, <laughs> emotional, ancestral, cellular, spiritual, bliss. Spiritual, thank you. Bliss. Yeah. Yes. So what yeah. yeah, so what are these seven bodies of existence? Um and what's density mean? Like this is physical, so it's like wood and like skin and like body, but then like bliss is like overwhelmingly like sensational inside of me or ethereal it can't be described with words so there's no density i'm like one percent the way there i don't understand i mean it's so hard to explain um and i'm not even i'm not even all the way there um we'll so this was will never be there never be Always, Except the there is here, here is there. Always a work in progress. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everything's upside down, inside out, and backwards. Um, okay, so the seven bodies. You so we'll just kind of walk our way through. You have a physical body. Yes. That's yes, undeniable. Yes, I believe yes, you're here. Yes. You have an intellectual body. You have thoughts. You can like you can hear yourself talking to yourself. It's going all day long. It's intelligent. It's deep. It's right. You have an emotional body. Um, you have an ancestral lineage that is connecting you 
that is your past, that is where you come from, that, that my cells, my DNA, I have an ancestral body. Um, you have a spiritual body, which is a bit, um, it's less restrictive. Oh, than the physical. Than this. Than in this one. Yeah, than yeah. this density. So everything's energy. Again, there's scale and different wavelengths and who, you know, we're still discovering more and more and more. But your physicality is, is denser and your bliss body and your spiritual body are higher in frequency and therefore able to reach farther. Um, they don't know the limits of the physical realms. Um, and everyone has that. If you are alive, you have that. And it is about developing your tool belt in each layer of life. Um, that will help you feel more capable and alive and true and powerful and sexual and blissful. Like the things that we're all in our physical bodies with our intellectual minds trying to get to, it's backwards. We can't, the tiny mind cannot comprehend the expanse of our spiritual body and our bliss bodies and even sexuality. You, you know, you, you're, you will have better sex when you get out of your mind. Your mind can't fully comprehend. Like, let the mind go and let the body experience, let it be swept away. So, as humans, especially Americans in today's society, we really, really treasure the intellectual mind. Mm -hmm. And it's valuable, yeah. it's treasurable, it totally. it's deserves it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but not at the expense of the rest of who you are. Mm. Um, so I don't know if I okay. Know. Yeah, that's that's a, at least getting us to think in seven different, you know, <laughs> at least because versus just walking around not even contemplating these seven, at least there is a difference between you know a physical and a, you know an intellectual and an emotional. When when I saw um, Bird, burden of genius, and at the very end when um, um, when uh, I I really had like a big epiphany about. Uh, Dr. Thomas Starsell and the work that um, he did in order to make organ transplanting so uh, widely uh, mm. a able to happen across the world um, and just the hard work that he did in order to make it happen and so many others that helped him do it. I mean, I was, I was, it was very interesting. I had a moment when I started just like, just like really like the emotions came mm. and it was just so profoundly emotional for me. And there was this interesting moment where my brain tried to turn it, like, or my my being tried to turn it off. Yep. And I like kind of like grabbed my head to try and like like to turn the valve off. Yeah. It was really fascinating. And then I was like, no way. And then I like let it go, like <laughs> like waterfall. <laughs> and I just started sobbing and like yeah. and like really feeling what it was like to. And actually, if I would have like. I, I really strongly think that that intellectualizing would have, I would have lost the true feeling of what I was trying to um, experience in that moment, which was that deep, profound connection to the to the difficulty that all of those humans went through to make organ transplanting as um, prominent as it is today, and saving as many lives as it is today. By by turning that valve off, it would have. Yeah, so um, this is just you know the emotional body, and then all the way up to you know the spiritual and bliss, the bliss bodies. I think bliss and the ultimate spiritual body, at least some of the all part of the ultimate spirit and bliss, comes from being in flow. When you're in such yeah. deep, uh, it's like the most deepest cognitive instinct is is when you're just lose track of time and everything else, and you're just hammering yeah. out what you love doing, and and so um, that's. And yeah, whatever exists past the three D realms. Well, <laughs> so much. So much. Okay, let's get to these. Fi let's get to these final questions because we could talk forever. Um, let's uh, let's ask you what is a core driving principle of yours? I see. 
see it as this golden pillar of life giving light. It's the place that I create from. It's the place that I go to inside of myself. It's my first source. It is what I believe is infinite source. Yeah. Yeah, I imagined a, like a, I don't know why, but just complete whiteness and then a big golden pillar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's cool. That's cool. It's just radiating yeah. light. Life. Yeah. yeah. Life. Yeah. Light. Yeah. It's a good question. I actually had. That's a cool way I to had, see yourself. <laughs> well, I had done that instinctually, automatically, but I've never had to articulate that to someone. That's what we try and do. <laughs> That's what we try and do. To get these, get this heart to come out in new ways. Yeah. How about if you could re? build civilization from scratch? How would you design it? I would give everyone a little Luna. I would give everyone a little, a little Luna, Luna puppy. The, the anim, <laughs> hashtag animal therapy. Uh, yeah, hashtag uh, puppy therapy. Puppy therapy. Um, oh God, that's okay. What's the question again? How would I redesign society? Yeah, how would you rebuild civilization from scratch? I would take out a lot of terms. So in our human, like I, I see humans interacting without these limiting terms, these beliefs um, that create, over time have created power struggle and they've created separation and they've created you versus me and if those terms, that terminology, that way of thinking was not there, I believe we would remember that we're all one and you would be without that. Mm, so like some of the terms that, uh, that, that, um, that have pushed us more towards the, 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 the illusion that we are uh, separate from each other. And I hate that illusion. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Yeah. Deep meditation and psychedelics have really destroyed that barrier um, yeah. and made it made, makes makes it understand that we are not separate, that we are one. Yeah. Um, interesting. Cool. And then, how about this is simulation? So we're going to ask you: Are we in a simulation? <laughs> Sure. Sure. We're in a simulation and I've got the power. It's for sure. Like Yeah. Yeah, you be leveling up. For like, sure. It's one of those it's one of those things to me that's like, all right, I have to choose between a belief. I have, I have to choose between two things and one of them I'm gonna believe. Which one makes me feel more powerful? Which one makes me believe that I can? Oh, okay, fine. Sure, we're in a simulation and I'm God. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, I don't know how to answer that yeah, question yeah. other than that. Yeah. <laughs> so then am I in my own as well and I'm God in mine and that we're... Yeah. Yeah, yeah interesting. That's what I'm going to believe. God, we're gods yeah. in our own simulations that we're leveling up in. Yeah. Yes. I love it. Great. <laughs> I love it. So, okay, so we're approaching the exponential technology and automation age. So what do we, uh -huh. what's a good thing to teach kids? Technology and automation age for the kids. What do the kids need to know? But their human bodies is where all of this originated from. That their true life 
is what created, is what made the creation of technology possible. That's what I got for that, you today. <laughs> that, that was really good. That was really good. Yes. Holy cow. Um, yeah, that's because without that, without this, yeah, without this evolutionary step of life, the the exponential technology and artificial general intelligence ages that we're jumping into, they couldn't be here without life, without this biological forms that, that made that. Yeah, because yeah, dinosaurs and chimpanzees and, and little multicellular ocean dwelling organisms would not have made AGI. So this is, that's very interesting that you point that out. So always remember, huh? That's kind of cool. Always remember. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Okay, and then last question is, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? You. You, every human. You are the most beautiful thing in the world. And Luna. <laughs> you are the most beautiful thing in the world. Interesting. So then that so then the an, so the answer is you know pointed back at at, at at you. So basically then then ever then everything. So the answer is kinda like you as in yeah. everything. I am the most beautiful thing in the world. Yeah. You are the most beautiful thing in the world. Yeah, yeah. Human life is the most beautiful thing in the world. Yeah, it's just beyond c comprehension how blessed we are to have life evolved here. And it's just also just, yeah. Anyway, it can, it can, we could go for another hour talking about how, how it, just incredible it is that we have evolved here and yet how, how crazy it is some of the, um, some of the things that we talked about in this episode, how some of those things happen. It's like, yeah, how, how blessed are we that we're here, but yet we have things that we act, that we do that cause such, yeah, such, such trauma. It's Coco, this is We're been, creating the simulation. Yeah. <laughs> this has been such a pleasure, Coco. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. It's been very enlightening. Mm. Again, just shattered and pieced back together multiple times. Yeah. Such a yeah. Privilege. Thank you. Thank you for coming on to the show. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> There's so, so much to still um, get behind the eyes. I can't, I can't reiterate it enough, you know, get behind the eyes of other people as well as, as well and as often as you can to understand their complex life journeys of what got them to where they're at. Um, for not only the hundred billion people that lived and died before us to build civilization, but also when you're talking about some complex political issue um, like assault um, and rape, well, go and talk to someone that has actually been raped or that has been assaulted and go talk to them for an hour about their experience before tweeting about something. So we just need to do a better job at really going and empathizing because this has been, again, just... Yeah, this is what I think this is what needs to happen in order to create a deeper sense of humanity for us across the world. Um, and everyone go and, you know, go and visit, you know, CocoMcKenzie.com to actually look at these resources, go and check out Fresh and how we can distribute this, um, um, this, this to, to more people around the world so that, so that at the time of some sort of an, of an issue arising like this, there can be a very quick um, way to properly um, and effectively get through through this and it's so awesome that things have evolved way past what it was in 2012 to 2019 of just um, the, the processes so it's good that we are, that we're evolving these processes um, give us your thoughts in the comments below we'd love to hear from you and also you already know but support artists and entrepreneurs and people that are healing so support Kogo, support people like us. All those links are below. And go and build the future, everyone. We love you very much. We love you. We do. <laughs> we love you so much. Thank you again.
Go and build, create, manifest that destiny into the world. Much love, and we'll see you soon, everyone. Bye. Peace.